Um, I'm a little bit out of my element. I just got back from London a few hours ago, and I'm also regularly called a noob when I try to play any games at all. So um, I'm not sure if any of what I say will be so overly simplified that it might be annoying. But I do hope to share at least a little bit about human rights in general that hopefully you haven't heard before, or hopefully actually you have heard before and you're just here to learn more about. Um, and so uh, I'd like to start just by reminding people or kind of painting a general picture about the human rights situation uh, around the world. And I assume if you're here, you have some interest in human rights or you hate human rights and you're here to attack me uh, or something like that. And afterwards, we'll have some questions about anything at all that's related to anything at all that I, I discussed. But um, I suppose I can start with uh, the most obvious, biggest human rights, I guess, general situations that people have heard about in this last year relating to technology, which are, uh, thank you, China. And uh, China and Iran, yes. Uh, not, most, has anyone not heard about what's going on in China and Iran? And it's hard for me to see because there are spotlights in my face, but all right. So I, So in Iran, you saw millions of people come out into the streets, and the picture seems to be heavily pixelated uh, when it's blown up like that, uh, come out to protest about the election results that were contested, and generally kind of in a movement for democracy. Now, there's a lot more specifics to what's going on in Iran than most of us know about, and then the press will talk about, for example. A lot of credit was given to Twitter and other social media networks, whether that is rightfully or wrongfully given. The point is that technology played a much more pivotal role in this uh, effort towards reform than has been in the past, or at least than we've realized. And frankly, this is probably one of the first situations, not to mention Moldova or other places where you saw modern social media and technology really play a role where it could have tipped the course of, of what was happening. And then, of course, um, it's a little bit further back, but some of you know what happened when the, in Burma when the monks, monks kind of rose up for uh, human rights and reform. And uh, uh, Time, Newsweek, all the magazines covered this, and then nothing happened afterwards, which usually is what happens when people risk their lives like this. Nothing happens afterwards because the, the uh, outside world kind of paints a picture of what's going on. It's very compelling. It dominates talk news shows, and then we kind of move on to the next celebrity baby. Uh, and this is what happens. And uh, I'm not sure how many of you have ever seen this image. Does anyone know what this image is of? Yes? North Korean labor camp, very good. How do you know that? I couldn't hear anything, but I'm assuming you have a good reason. Okay, yeah, it's, uh, it's actually a picture uh, from the outside of Yodok concentration camp uh, in North Korea. And uh, today in North Korea, there are at least 12 and up to 30 different kinds of concentration or labor camps uh, meant for people that commit crimes as heinous as listening to a foreign radio broadcast or folding an image of the dear leader's face. The dear leader is the second one. There's a third one coming up now, but the second one. If you fold an image so his face is creased, you're, uh, I guess you're disrespecting the revolution and him and all that, and you will be sent to camps. If you uh, read outside media or newspapers or, or magazine, if you complain about rations, you will be sent to a camp. Uh, and North Korea has a great policy that carries out punishment up to the third generation, which means if I screw up, my kids and my grandkids will all be sent uh, to concentration camps. And so I was going to show you this, but my computer kind of froze, so I can't show you on Google Earth. But you're welcome to go on Google Earth at your convenience at home, and you can see where all the l concentration camps are. Not only can you find them, you can actually see every road, every gate post, every guard post, the mass graves, the execution sites, everything. And so when we talk about how much awareness the world today has about what's going on in other places, when we compare it to our supposed uh, ignorance of human rights violations that we talked about in the 30s and 40s. Oh, we don't know, we didn't know the Holocaust was happening, we didn't know Rwanda was happening. And, you know, a lot of that wasn't true back then. But even now, you guys can go home and check these out on Google Earth and actually find the sites of where some of these atrocities are happening. Uh, so that's kind of just to paint a slightly depressing picture of the human rights situation as a whole. Now, how does technology relate to this? Uh, my background I as an individual, I worked on the North Korea issue in particular. Uh, we worked on trying to help refugees escape from the country. Uh, and so North Koreans, uh, a million North Koreans starved to death in the 1990s. It's a very high number. A million human beings died in one of the most painful ways known to man. And very few people noticed. In fact, very few people probably in this room were aware of that. Uh, that's kind of depressing. It says a lot about the media and politics and humanity, if that many people can die in that way and we don't really care. Um, 
but that's just one small part of what's happening in North Korea. And as a result of all the human rights violations, and I'll summarize in about 30 seconds, every human right that you have that's guaranteed to you under all sorts of laws, domestic and international, uh, freedom of religion, speech, assembly, movement, dissent, the right to complain, uh, all these things do not exist in North Korea. Uh, and if you leave the country without permission, even if you got lost, even if you're a child and your mother went and you were following them, even if you got drunk, which actually happened uh, once to an American that crossed the other way, um, you will be sent to uh, camp because it's treason punishable by death according to North Korean law. And the North Koreans will not deny that. And so over the last 10, 15 years, up to 250,000 North Koreans have crossed over into China at various points and now they're in hiding. And the Chinese government does what? Guess. They send them back. They not only they don't they don't they don't just wait for them to fall on their laps. They actually go out looking for these people. They have bounties on the heads of refugees, uh, higher bounties on the heads of activists. And when you catch them, they send them to camp in China, do some you know beating and abuse, and possibly send them off into slavery now and then. And if that doesn't work, they'll send them back to North Korea, where they'll be sent to a concentration camp. Uh, and often they are faced they face very very brutal conditions. I don't want to get too much into those details, um, but I would urge you to look them up. Uh, yourselves. Now, when I was working on this field, I was actually right along those border regions that you see uh, between China and North Korea, right along the top edge of the map. There are two rivers there. And uh, oftentimes we would try to avoid detection by the Chinese or the North Koreans or anybody else. And oftentimes being young, kind of reckless, not, well, I guess we are, we're reckless, but young, under resourced uh, activists, we didn't have the tools at our disposal that would have been helpful. Uh, defensive tools that would help keep us off the radar in all sorts of ways, whether it's off uh, telecommunications or when we're doing internet, making sure our, our transmissions were not being intercepted. Uh, there were a lot of things that we did not know existed uh, that many of you know exist. Uh, and in 2006, uh, through a series of unfortunate events, I was arrested in China along with a number of team members and refugees. Um, and then we subsequently managed to get out and everybody, the refugees included, managed to get out and, and get uh, get to safety. So we're very happy that that happened. But that whole experience and this kind of long story is a, is a way for me to get to the point, which is there are human rights activists all over the world that are doing incredible things with very little resources and risking and or giving their lives and often they face torture, punishment, execution, their whole families get shot for something really, really, really asinine and stupid. Like they blogged and they complained and then someone picked it up and then sent them to a camp. Or they uh, made a phone call when they shouldn't have during the protest and they got picked up and sent over. Or they tweeted about the locations where the, the royal, the Republican guards were in Iran or something like that. And then, um, and then the, the, the authority said, why are you... Uh, conspiring with the protesters or whatnot, and then they get sent over. And these are very, very basic mistakes that they're making, and often they're not mistakes per se, because they're just thoughtfully writing on a platform they assume to be safe that is not. Uh, and so what occurred to me was that there were a number of technologies that exist today, uh, countless te technologies, including what the previous presentation talked about, which is amateur radio and all sorts of variations on that, that could be really exploited or used by human rights activists that are fighting for freedom all over the world. Now, I want to specify that uh, human rights activists come in all sorts of stripes and colors, you know, different parties and politics and all that. And that, and on that issue, I'm fairly agnostic. The point is, if you're shot for what you say, uh, generally you should be protected. And you should be able to complain or say what you believe without being tortured for it. And so that's kind of the bar that we're talking about. Uh, so really, and these are the, the, uh, digit the satellite pictures of the camps in North Korea, by the way. So today there are a list of about 30 to 60 countries that restrict human rights uh, digitally in some way and these are among the worst violators and it's just kind of a sampling of the different countries some of them you've heard about Iran and, and Burma in particular I'm sure you've heard about uh, Russia and Vietnam China Cuba Egypt Tunisia Zimbabwe North Korea North Korea is a little bit tricky because they don't have a lot of digital things in general except for uh, missiles um, but uh, uh, they do uh, manage to utilize technologies to monitor when they can uh, and this is just a short list I'm gonna kind of uh, in case you're not aware, there's something called the Universal Declaration of Human Rights that was passed by basically every country in the world that's a legitimate country of some sort. And legitimate, of, of course, is a questionable term, but uh, every country that is part of the United Nations uh, has agreed to this. And Article 19 that was signed in 1948 says, everyone has the right to freedom of expression. This includes freedom. This freedom includes freedom. <laughs> It sounds like there's a typo. It includes freedom to hold opinions without interference and to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas through any media 
regardless of frontiers, which is another way of saying borders. Uh, now, we can always argue about what the intent and spirit behind laws are and, and their actual application, but I think it's pretty obvious here. It means you can say what you want without being punished for it. It's pretty simple. Uh, this is international law under the United Nations Declaration. People have all agreed to this, and it is being denied and kind of laughed at uh, and mocked all over the world today. So this is, these are some of the excuses that some of these regimes make. This is from an article from the Christian Science Monitor last year. In the past year, writers in general have been arrested and imprisoned for such alleged charges as inciting subversion of state power, which is China, insulting religion, which is Iran, threatening state security, Burma, defaming the president of the republic, Egypt, storing cultural products with contents against the Socialist Republic of Vietnam, and spreading false news, Syria. Many of these countries in the world have managed to find creative ways uh, to persecute people for just general freedom of speech issues uh, and throw them into camps. Some of them don't even bother trying creative ways. They don't even bother making laws and they just arrest them anyway. Um, and so some of the problem that these activists have, uh, and again, I want to remind you, it might be difficult because if you're here at this conference, uh, you have a pretty good awareness of technology and especially internet and communications technology. And most of your friends probably do too. Uh, the average activist in some of these places does not. Their access to a computer is on occasion, they'll go to an internet cafe somewhere on the corner and type messages to their friends. Uh, their phone is just the phone they bought at the supermarket. Their SIM card is just the SIM card they bought at the supermarket. There is no reason for them to think, maybe the SIM card is being tracked, or maybe there's a guy whose only job is to watch me all day long digitally. There, it doesn't occur to you. And frankly, if you're in a context where your exposure to technology is fairly limited, it's almost magical. And I'm not saying magical and like, oh, they're so primitive, but really, why would you think there's a guy whose job is to just watch you all the time online? Uh, but there is. <laughs> and China and Iran and Russia and these countries have spent billions of dollars on infrastructure meant exclusively to monitor their own citizens and activists abroad. And if you saw the whole scandal happen with Google and Gmail and China and all that, and the reason why Google threatened to pull out of China, uh, I've been getting those emails for years where someone types with multiple typos, Dear Sir, we'd love to invite you to some conference about this and this human rights. Please see attachment. And of course, you never attach it, or you never open it, but if you respond and say, hey, can you send me a, uh, just the text, then there's no response. Uh, and it happens continually. I mean, there, there are large numbers of people funded by these governments or actively in their militaries whose focus is to watch these, these, uh, these dissidents and activists and journalists. And so if you're a journalist, you're going to make a phone call to your family. You're going to say, hey, I'm going to go to this city. We're having a meeting of our, of our leadership, and we're going to try to see what we can do to get uh, all the reporters to report on the atrocities the government's doing. Uh, or you have another person say, hey, here's a list of all our active leadership in this country or this city at this time. Can you pass it on to that guy over there so he can do something with it? Very run-of-the-mill, day-to-day stuff. Uh, but if you're, an, if you're a hostile regime looking at that, that's data you want desperately. And that's data you'll use to execute people. Uh, and so many of you are familiar with Tor. I heard there was a great talk about Tor today. Many of you are familiar with other circumvention technologies. You're familiar with basic ways to use proxies or, or get around firewalls. Some of you studied abroad in China or other countries and got your YouTube fixed just by using simple proxies or VPNs. All this stuff, all these acronyms that I now are more familiar with, most of these people don't know exist. Now some of these activists have access to foreigners or, or technicians or technologists that know these things and will give them software and hardware and show them how to use it, but the vast majority don't. Uh, and when you're in a situation where someone that has three kids gets sent off to a concentration camp for writing that, hey, maybe before this earthquake killed millions of people, we should have built our schools properly, um, it's ridiculous. It's offensive, it's ridiculous, and frankly, it shouldn't be stand, uh, we shouldn't stand for it. Uh, so these are some of the problems that activists are facing. Uh, they're not particularly tech savvy. Uh, there's a great amount of internet censorship, so they don't even know that they're not tech savvy, if that makes any sense. So they're not tech savvy to begin with, and then if they try to type in, if you're in China and you type in circumvention methods, I doubt much is going to show up. I don't even know if you know the word circumvention, method, you know. But beyond that, you're not going to be able to access what's going on, and you're not going to know what you're missing because many of the bigger Western Internet companies that are based in places like China have corroborated with local governments to the extent where at least Google it would say, here's the Tiananmen Square results that we're allowed to show you, and, this, and just so you know, there's a bunch that's censored. They wouldn't tell you what's censored, but they said something is censored. So the user knows there's some part of the picture that's missing. Uh, some other search giants uh, don't do that. They'll just censor without saying it. And so you don't know if you're missing anything at all. 
And then on top of that, you have issues that you're heavily, heavily monitored beyond just the internet. Not only are PCs and cyber cafes being watched, your cell phones are being watched, every method of communication you can think of is being monitored outside of basic human to human. And even that is monitored because secret police and the infiltration of these entities is a very aggressive uh, concern. Um, and finally, low resources. Even if they knew these things existed, they don't know anybody to ask, they don't know how to get access to them. Sometimes you have to buy actual hardware or subscribe to actual software. They don't know how to do any of this stuff. Um, and so some of the ways that I think those of you here can help, and again, I want to make a disclaimer that I may not be properly calling it by its official term or any of these things, but I know what the need is. Um, the first is circumvention tools, and we talked about Tor and other things that are very effective ways for people to get around firewalls so they can access information. Some of the other ones are anonymization tools that can help them, and sometimes they, come, they go hand in hand with circumvention tools, but really so they can prevent being identified by their location or the IP address and really protect their identity, especially if they're a dissident blogger. Now, there are dissident bloggers all over the world. Dissident blogger sounds like a weird term, but they're really sent to camps for writing a blog. And packaging and simplifying. Now, uh, it's one thing to tell a blogger or a dissident or a journalist or, or, or an opposition leader, hey, you guys should really be using Tor or you'd be using this and that. Uh, it's another for them to actually be able to turn it on and figure out how it works, especially if it's not in their native language and especially if they're using uh, operating systems or computers that are slow and clunky and old. They're not necessarily going to be able to use these, especially, you know, and as you know, when you're using proxy servers and all that, it slows down a bit. Uh, there is a real need for somebody to translate that to them so they can do it almost plug and play, and that's part of what we're trying to work on now. Just to give you an example, uh, and I know I'm starting to ramble, of uh, how clever these, these uh, semi-totalitarian regimes are. Uh, the Vietnamese government uh, monitors their citizenry on the internet, and uh, a lot of their citizens are actually on blogs and organized and, and you know, use social networks and all of that. Um, and the government not only recently installed their version of China's kind of green dam filtering software on all their computers, they made it mandatory that you're going to have kind of censorship on all the computers. Uh, most opposition or totalitarian regimes will try to hack into your computer and put stuff on your computer so they can read what you're doing. Keyboard loggers or keystroke loggers, all that stuff. What the Vietnamese government did is they compromised the source of a keyboard... Uh, programs. You know when you download, if you're trying to get a Korean or a Vietnamese keyboard, you go to a site and you download that language pack so you can use it? They changed that. They put a key, keystroke logger into that. So everyone that downloaded that then was compromised. I mean, it's very, very clever. And the thing is, how would any dissident know that? How are they going to ever realize that that's the case? Unless some technologist or somebody that has the resources proactively looks at these things, checks for these things, and tells them, here's why you really should not be doing this. And here's an alternative that you can be using instead. And finally, we have to not only develop these tools, but train people to use them and deploy them. Deploy sounds very simple, usually, but deploy here means crossing a border that is often illegal to cross, or getting it to them, uh, and sometimes meeting them is difficult. So these are all very specific, practical uh, concerns that come up when you're trying to help dissidents or people in other countries do this. Uh, now, I'm just going to mention just a couple very obvious ways that people can help besides the, the subjects we talked about. Uh, the first is development, testing, and customization. Now, we have a number of tools that are already being utilized or being tested in different environments now, and I can't say specifically where, but uh, a lot of things are being tested by groups that are much better at this than I am. Uh, but sometimes you need to customize it for the local conditions or even just put a language pack on because they speak some language that is not necessarily in the top five of Internet software. Uh, languages and we need help doing that. Uh, another thing is that we need to work on developing new tools. There are several very popular tools that are working very, very effectively, but it's just a matter of time, like everything else, that when the uh, the uh, the other guys will will catch up and, and crack it. And the more targets there are for uh, a totalitarian regime to look at, the the better it is for dissidents and activists and people trying to hide in in, in the shadows. Uh, and I2P, I2P is one particular. Uh, platform that I'd like you to hear about. And a afterwards, after we go through a couple questions, I'm going to ask a representative from ITP to speak here for just about you know two, two to five minutes to tell you a little bit about what that is and how you guys can actually very easily get involved in that effort to help, uh, help to protect these people. 
in case you want any more specific information, that's info at pegasusnk.com. Uh, I do want to apologize because um, you can tell my comfort level with the tech side of this is not fully there. Uh, so I'm very hesitant to talk aggressively about that. But I will uh, spend the next few minutes talking more specifically about the human rights situation. Um, it's hard to realize how bad things are from here. And from here, I really mean, you know, specifically, yeah, New York, a hotel, a conference, Manhattan, but really just from anywhere that's not there. And by there, I just mean this vague term that, like this bucket that we put the rest of the world in, right? The, the, the dark corners of the earth where people are dying of disease and people hack to each other to death and public executions happen and people throw battery acid on, on children for going to school. We kind of, you know, we, we put it into buckets. This is us and home and the Western world and the safe places with maybe Cancun and the cool vacation spots we go to for spring break. And then there's there, the bad places, the places where dangerous things happen where, you know, 10,000 people can die and it only counts if an American was among them. Or, you know, one teenage girl that gets lost on spring break somewhere kind of evens out to about a million random nameless foreigners that die in a terrible way, which is really kind of how it works. Uh, so it was really difficult for me, because I grew up in San Diego in a very comfortable environment, uh, to realize how bad things are. Um, but literally in this day and age, you can get on a plane, and three hours later, you will be in one of the most horrific places on the earth. And 12 hours later, you'll be in North Korea. And the whole concept of witnesses, right? Now, after the Holocaust, which most of you have had some degree of education about, uh, you know, six million Jews, maybe six million uh, gypsies and dissidents and all sorts of other folks were, were, were killed. Uh, the whole world kind of had a crisis of conscience. And it's different now, because right now it's like, yeah, it happened. We know it happened. And then here's what it did for politics. Uh, world War II, this and that, FDR. We kind of put it in, in, a, in a timeline, and it's just one other thing. But at the time when it happened, when people first got pictures of concentration camps and, pick, you know, and, and the generals liberated uh, Dachau and Auschwitz and saw stacks of bodies and people trying to do experiments on human hair and people cutting off pieces of your lung to see how long you could breathe, it shocked humanity. It was something that they thought humanity had progressed beyond. We, we were, were done with the Inquisition. We done, we're done with burning witches and all this stuff. We're, we're more civilized now. Human beings cannot do this to each other. And not to mention the people that did it were not uh, primitive in, in the way they saw it. They were a very developed Western country. Uh, so at the time in the 30s and 40s, people started learning about the Holocaust and what had happened and discussing it. And really the philosophers, and not just the philosophers, but everybody, went through kind of a crisis where they thought, how can we be capable of such evil? And what does it say about us? And if you go back and read the literature at that time, there's a lot of very interesting conclusions they came to. Um, and then the conclusion politically they came to was, number one, it's unacceptable. Such, hard, such tremendous cruelty is unacceptable. And number two, it doesn't matter who you are, even if you're a soldier whose general holds a gun to you and says, shoot that child, you have a moral obligation to do what's right, even if it disagrees with your law or your commanding authority. And you also, if you know anything about the Nuremberg trials, that's the conclusion. It doesn't matter what the law is, it doesn't matter what your commanding officer or president or dictator says to you, it doesn't matter what pressures you're under, the obligation is to do the right thing. Uh, and the, the catchphrase that's tossed around a lot is, we are all witnesses that and never again. Now in this day and age when all of us can watch the same YouTube clip at the same time, when we can see what happens uh, on a sports game, you know, two billion people are watching the World Cup at the same time, the opening ceremonies, the Olympics, the definition of what a witness is is very different. And if we can find out 10 minutes later that an entire village of people was burned down in, Eastern, or in Western Sudan in, in Darfur, 10 minutes later, not 10 years later, 10 minutes later we can find it out. If we can get satellite imagery of smoke rising up from the mass graves real time, our obligation to do something is very different than it used to be. Very, very different. And if you can find ways like these ways I'm talking about that really don't require much work, much sacrifice, or much risk at all, there really is no excuse left. And so if you've ever not known about the bad things happening in the world, and that includes human rights on a broader level, but more specifically freedom of expression and speech, which is really what the internet is supposed to be fighting against. We have this tendency to think internet is something that's inherently good, that this modern technology is inherently open and will always help humanity move forward. That is not the case. Some of the biggest Western technological companies have sold their software and hardware to the biggest oppressors uh, in the Middle East, Africa, or Asia. Some of the same technologies that you use to look at cool things or develop uh, innovation with your friends uh, are being used to 
harm innocence, very simply. So first, we have to get rid of the notion that technology is always good. It's not. It's a tool like anything else. If the user is malicious, it will be used for malicious ends. Uh, but if you've ever, if your excuse on some level was ever, oh, I don't really know what's happening, and now you know, even though I didn't articulate it very well, you can find out on your own about some of the things that are happening, and you have no excuse in the age of Google and space age flight, uh, where you can sit in a metal tube and cross the ocean in, fi in, in five hours, there's really no way we could say we don't know, especially here. If your excuse was ever, oh, we don't know what to do, there's plenty that you can do, and I can be very specific about some ways that I haven't mentioned here or I can't really mention on camera about ways you can get involved. And if the, if the thought was ever, oh, I don't have anyone really asking me, it's not my place, I'll ask you now, if you're in this room, please help on some way, whether it's humanitarian or human rights or freedom of expression or you know, literally physically protecting people, there's a desperate, desperate need for these people to be, to be helped. And so just to wrap up, I want to share two things that really changed my thinking on this issue. And I think I still have a long way to go, but there's two things that really uh, made it more real for me. Uh, the first uh, is that Everyone that's an activist likes to use this, oh, my kids will ask me what I did, or our kids will ask me what I did, and I will say I did something. You know, whether we talk about global warming, or the polar bears, or whatever, education, we say, you know, our children will judge us. That's the phrase we use all the time. And so I used to say it too. I'd be like, oh yeah, yeah. our kids, I wouldn't say it happily, but you know, I used to say, yes, when I have kids, they will ask us what we did at this moment when we knew this was happening, uh, and we have to have an answer for them. But two years ago, I started thinking about that a little bit more, and I realize, yeah, that's the case, but it actually goes to a whole nother level. When I have kids, if I am lucky enough to have kids, and they look at the world and modern history, or all of history, and they're learning in school, and they're you know, deciding what they want to do with their lives, for them, when they look back on human history, every time mankind faced a choice against good and evil, and I, you know, good and evil are like comic book words now, but... I think there is such a thing as good and there is such a thing as evil. And you kind of know it inside. It doesn't matter what your religion or background is. You know what is good and what is bad. No one teaches their kids, you know, go punch that kid in the face. Just, <laughs> that's the right thing to do. Like, no one does that, you know what I mean? It, really, you want your, 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 you, you teach goodness in some way. And it gets warped along the process. But generally, we know good and evil. You have some voice that tells you that is not okay or that is okay. Uh, and when our kids look back and see a world where we had a real choice between human evil on a, or good and evil on a big scale. On a big scale, we were faced with a holocaust or a genocide or something like that, and we got to choose. We always chose evil. Either by deliberately supporting the bad guys or by not supporting the good guys, we always chose evil. And when you look back, really, that is the case. When have we ever had a real moral victory where we sacrifice? And yeah, we talk about World War II, we have video games about it, but I mean, we didn't really do it to save them, we saved it to save us, you know, and it's, 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 it's a different thing. Um, so that's concerning because that raises questions not just about East Asia or Africa or the Middle East, it raises questions about humanity. What is mankind for? What have we done with this great civilization and scra gleaming skyscrapers and modern technology if people are still have limbs hacked off while their families watch just because they speak a different language? And the second thing, and this is you know, I don't know how many of you um, are familiar with Martin Luther King Jr.'s particular stories. Now, we all know that one big speech, the, the I Have a Dream speech, but there was another speech he gave just before he died. Uh, it was the last public speech he gave, and he talked about a certain parable uh, about the Good Samaritan. And if you know the Good Samaritan story, basically, this guy was robbed on a road, and he was beaten and left for dead, and then I think a priest and a, and a Levite walked by and ignored him. And then the third guy, who was a Samaritan, who at the time was kind of an outsider that nobody liked, stopped, helped him, gave him money, gave him food, kind of put medicine on him, took him to, a, to a, I guess, an inn and took care of him. And that's the story. And everyone talks about how it's important that you do the right thing, you help strangers, love one another, all sorts of things like that. Uh, Dr. King had an interesting twist on this that really crystallized for me what it means to be, I think, a responsible human being uh, today. He said, he said, first he said, you know, maybe these the priest and Levite had good reasons for ignoring that guy. You know, maybe he was late to go to service or late for a meeting and he had to rush and he saw it and he thought, oh, someone else is going to do it and he went. And I'm paraphrasing, of course. And maybe the second guy thought, you know, I want to help him, but I've heard sometimes they pretend to be hurt so they can rob me. And I don't want to risk my life. So I'm just going to hope that he's going to be okay. I'm going to send good thoughts and I'm just going to move on. Um, 
And those first two guys that saw this happen and kept walking asked themselves uh, a very simple question. They said, if I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? Right? If I stop to help this guy, what will happen to me? Very easy, simple question that we ask all the time. The third guy that stopped and actually did help him asked himself a very subtle, subtly different question. He said, if I do not stop to help this man, what will happen to him? And it's a very subtle distinction, but it changes everything. If we do not stop to help these people, what will happen to them? And it's easy to get lost in the numbers and the statistics of what's going on. It's easy to think, oh, we don't know anything about their culture. They're so different. It can't possibly uh, be something for me to do. Um, but in a situation, especially with this technology, where you can really save lives in such simple, simple, tiny, tiny ways, there is really no remaining reason why you, we shouldn't do it. Uh, and that's really what I wanted to share with this audience. I, I don't know a lot about the technologies that are being talked about here. I don't know a lot about the Hope Conference, but so far I have very good impressions. But what I wanted to do was show a little bit of, uh, of a glimpse of that side of what's happening in the world. And that, that world is not necessarily geographically the other side of the globe. It could also be right down the street from here. But there are things like this happening all over the world, and the people in this room have so many talents available to them, resources, not just money, unless some of you have money, then we'll take it. But uh, resources, technologies, abilities, knowledge, friends, that can really change a great deal. And I've been witness myself to situations where someone's life was forever changed because of something that anyone else would dismiss as meaningless. It's so small. And if we take just one-tenth of the time we spend on some of our blogs and video games, or even one one-hundredth for some of us, and diverted it just a little bit to this field, it might actually make a tremendous difference. And so uh, with that, I want to open up to questions. If anyone has any questions at all about any of the work we're doing or the specific human rights scenarios, uh, to the best of my ability that I can share on a recorded forum, I'd, I'd like to share more details. And then after just a few questions, I'm going to give the, t the, the forum over to someone that will share about one very particular way that you can get involved. Uh, as well. But thank you for hearing me out. All right, we, we have a lot of time actually, but I won't fill up the whole time. So, does anybody have any questions or, or specifics that you wanted to ask about? Yes. Sure. Um, and I'll repeat the question after if. Sure, yeah. sure. Do you want me to repeat the... Well, the question was, how, do we, how does he learn more about the specifics of what's going on with North Korea and the regional politics around it? Uh, and I, there's a couple specific blogs that are very good that I'll suggest, and I, I'll actually, I can just write them down for you if you come up afterwards. Yeah. But uh, specific to what you're talking about, there's a large population of, of Koreans in Japan that were taken there as slaves during World War II, and, and the Japanese took, I mean, they took a lot of people slave as slaves, but uh, specific to the Koreans who got particularly excessively screwed in that context. Uh, many of them ended up in Japan and they split in half. Half of them were loyal to North Korea and half were loyal to South Korea, which is really strange. And actually, the North Koreans in Japan are responsible for a huge percentage of North Korea's budget. And you're talking about the ones that are in Japan and are still citizens of North Korea. Many of them have never been to North Korea at all. And the one most famous one is a soccer player who played in the World Cup. He's called the People's Rooney, who didn't do very well. But that's, well, both Roonies didn't do very well. But um, uh, in that context, he, he's never lived in North Korea. He's been there. He drives a Hummer. But he has a very different lifestyle. And I suspect that if he knew more about the decisions he was making, uh, he would change his mind. But I've actually met many North Korean citizens that are in Japan uh, that are very confused because they, have, they don't have Japanese citizenship, which is one whole separate issue, but they have a North Korean citizenship, but they've never been to that country, and they're ex expected to be loyal to it. And so that's one of the weird complexities that are remaining after World War II, but I think you're on a good track if you're looking at those complexities. And I'll give you a couple of blogs afterwards if you're, if you're interesting. Okay, any other questions or? Yes, back.
When building tools for human rights activists, what sort of platform should we be targeting? I think the, the one platform that's most obviously targeted by everybody is the Internet. And specific to the Internet, you know, we're talking social media, Twitter, Facebook, blogs. Uh, that's what Tor does and that sort of thing. I will say that the problem with that is twofold. One is very serious, and the second is pretty obvious. And I'll start with the obvious one. The obvious one is that not a lot of places have Internet. So you're dealing with the Afghani countryside where radio is the platform, not Internet per se. Uh, or Burma, where radio is more of the platform, even though they have an internet. Or North Korea, where nothing is the platform between citizens. So then you have to adapt and change the, the medium of communication to fit the context. And internet works in many places, but there are a lot of places where it doesn't. So the other platforms would be radio. And radio, not only in the traditional sense, but you know, digital over analog. And there's all sorts of ways you can adapt that. Uh, and phones. And phones are actually very key pieces of... Uh, they're the very key tools. In the North Korean border with China, people smuggle in cell phones from China, take it into North Korea, and there's actually a whole news agency whose reporters are inside North Korea reporting out on cell phones, and they take pictures of like riots that are happening inside the country. So that is a very important thing. Now, the, the first point, um, the less obvious but more important thing, is that the countries that do have Internet that we're focusing on, like, like Iran, and we all talk about how important these things are, can easily just turn it off. And it doesn't occur to anybody, but if the, they're using the Internet to take down your government, why don't you just turn it off? And you'll say, yeah, well, what about the banking sector and security? They can either separate it, and you, you can very easily kind of s physically separate the networks, uh, or you'll be willing to take that hit. If you had to choose between losing you know, a couple million or a billion or losing your country and your hold over a, you know, hold over a nation, you would, you would choose the former. And there are plenty of examples, like in Iran in particular, during the election time or the anniversary of somebody's death, um, or in a whole region in China, they just turn off the internet entirely. Sometimes they even turn off the cell phone tower so no news gets out at all. So then you have to go really old school and go with really, really, really mobile hardware that you can take into areas and create. So a lot of the technologies that we're developing for humanitarian circumstances, where there's no networks at all, really apply very well for human rights situations. The only problem is often humanitarian uh, platforms are meant to be as open as possible. And that does not work with the human rights context. Any other questions? Yes. Mm -hmm. He was recommending nkeconwatch.com. You know, I will tell you, actually, there are other overlays, and Google does centralize some of them, but the ones that are somewhat more difficult for Google to kind of support are, you can just Google KML and, or KMZ and, and that, that topic. But uh, this is something, actually, that's not well known. Uh, you guys can just make the layer yourself. And oftentimes, dissidents or defectors have that info, but they don't know what a layer is. <laughs> and if you can sit there and literally log this, or if you can take their pictures that they've drawn on and put that into a KML layer, not only could it make a huge difference in awareness, but it could be used in a time of crisis. And you look at Haiti, after the earthquake happened, nobody had maps. Nobody had digital maps of what was going on on the ground. So some of the key activists actually organized very quickly in the next 24, 48 hours and created digital maps of every street in Haiti so that they could, so aid agencies could actually tell where they are and coordinate amongst each other. This is th these are things that all of you can very easily get involved in in a meaningful way. Yes? Mm -hmm. To some extent, anonymity, but to what extent would you say that that sort of uh, encryption or whatnot is used in activist communities? To what extent are GPG and other things actually used? Yeah. Very little. Now, it's used heavily in the activist tech community, whether it's you know WikiLeaks type of work or tech people that are approaching human rights situations. But field level people that are out there uh, don't even know. I mean, I recently learned, although I'm a special case, you know, I, I think uh, people don't, don't know that these things exist. And that's the problem. That's the, one of the things that we need to address is to be ambassadors for these technologies and continue to stay on top of new technologies so that they can actually utilize these uh, and hopefully improve their operations and, and lower their risk. So I would say that the, the penetration is extremely low, extremely low. Uh, yes? Uh, good question. A list of ways you can help. Well, there's one particular way we're going to talk about in a few minutes. Uh, there are many more actually fairly dramatic and, and interesting ways that I cannot say in a, in, on video, but I'd be happy to share with you 
if you come up afterwards. Uh, and um, I think in general, you should look to get involved with or start your own group of people that can kind of help support this because uh, I suspect that you know, we'd always talk about the, you know, many people can do things together and we'll all give a dollar each or we'll all go stand in some park and do it. And those things are important, but not always directly impacting the field. This is actually a very real way you can impact the field very easily. Really, you can really do it um, if, if you do it the right way. And so I'd be happy to share more information about that. And I hope that as we go forward, we'll be able to create more forums where we can publicly list some of these things. Like TOR is a great example. They're above ground. It's open. Everyone knows what they're doing and how they're doing it, and you can get involved directly. Um, but sometimes it's difficult, because if we say, hey, we're using such and such in this place, well, then they know it's coming, and then you're done. You can't do it anymore. Uh, so that's kind of the, the difficulty that we face sometimes. Maybe one final question, anyone? Yes. My concern is um, you told them to, to start a group. How do you coordinate, uh, as somebody who wants to be like a center for circumvention, how do you coordinate a bunch of mis misinformation, which is inevitably going to come out of having people actively engage? I personally work similarly to you on, on it, within Iraq and within the context of the Green Revolution. There was a significant amount of misinformation. There was uh, a whole movement to interrupt proxies, which did nothing or were immediately banned. Mm -hmm. People weren't uh, broadcasting that information. How do you stay then in communication with, with the rest of the organization so you don't get you know? no, That's a very good question. I think uh, um, I, I, he was re referring to just to summarize that. He was working in, in the Iran context after the re Twitter revolution or the Green Revolution and all this. And uh, there's a lot of, I would say, dysfunction or miscommunication amongst groups. And sometimes you waste resources by not knowing and not coordinating properly. Uh, the response for that is with any organization dealing with any issue ever, you coordinate and communicate and you don't act in a territorial way. And the problem is a lot of the, the groups that work in this field have been very territorial. And they say it's because of security issues, but really it's just it's because they want to be the cool guy with their own thing. And so I think it's important for groups to communicate openly with each other. You don't have to share all the details, but be willing to go out of your way to meet with people so you can make sure what you're doing is actually helping. And uh, make no, I have no illusion, just because I said it's easy to make a difference doesn't mean uh, you're not going to have to change some part of yourself. You're going to have to grow and learn more about the context and, and spe specific skill sets and understand the nuances of where you're going. You can't just kind of show up on a boat to some country and say, I will liberate you. You, you can't do that. You have, to, you have to know what you're getting into and you have to be sensitive about the context. And so, But I think if you go in with that in mind, like you're approaching anything else and you, you really go in knowing that you're going to have to learn and maybe change your assumptions and you're willing to learn from other people, uh, I think you can make a make a difference uh, in a way that's that's meaningful. But you're absolutely right. The, there is a, a a dysfunction, even among aid agencies that deliver like the same thing to the same place. They just it, there's no coordination. So what you end up having having is warehouses full of aid, like I saw in Haiti two months ago, uh, that are just rotting. And then you have people starving here. And the problem is that there's no bus in between them. It's like such an idiotic reason for people to die, but that's what it comes down to. Uh, and so that's partially why I think it's important to have more and more dialogue. And maybe the, one of the solutions that even the people in this room can come up with is a way for these groups to, 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 to communicate without compromising their information, their, their, their security concerns. I mean, maybe that's another thing that can kind of, uh, kind of be, be on the platform or the agenda. So uh, I want to thank you for taking a risk on this talk. I'm sure that you expected more out of the title, but, but um, I do think there are a lot of uh, ways that you can actually directly make a significant, significant impact, and I promise you that it would be a very, very meaningful uh, event. But I want to spend just a few minutes, if I could have uh, a friend of mine to speak about I2P in particular. Uh, some of you may have heard of it, some of you may have not, but I do think it's important to have uh, a greater diversity of different uh, platforms out there for activists to take advantage of. And this is one that you can very easily and simply plug into to support. So, thanks. Uh, thank you. Hi guys, I'm ZZZ. I'm the lead developer for I2P. Uh, in a couple minutes, I just want to get a couple messages out. I have stickers, and our website is getI2P.net. I want to thank you for just a couple minutes. Uh, we I2P has not quite met everything on your wish list yet, and ways that you can help is by using it. It's an anonymous network. It's a dark net. It uses strong encryption and it has no trusted parties. Uh, we're mainly focused on darknet, on building community, 
within the network. Uh, a lot of people run their own websites. Uh, we have chat. We have a lot of peer-to-peer -peer applications. We also have plugins for people to build more applications and uh, distributed file storage. Uh, the way that you can help by running I2P is first of all building cover traffic. The more dots on the map that we have of people running I2P and the more traffic that we push through the, the network, uh, the more cover it is for the people that perhaps really need anonymity. If, if you're looking to share a file with somebody, uh, maybe you're not that concerned with uh, who's going to catch you. Maybe it's not really a problem for you, but that traffic that you push through the network helps us make the network better, and it, it helps people that, that perhaps really need anonymity. Uh, as I said, we are peer-to-peer -peer friendly. We're, uh, the, the more traffic we push through, the better. Um, so help us grow the network. Uh, help us with these tools. Uh, I, I think that if all of you start running I2P, uh, some of you will see ways it could get better, and some of you will help us. Some of you may help us with our website. Some of you may help us with translations. Uh, some of you may turn into coders and, and help us with the coding. All of those can help, and all of those will help us get better and help us try to achieve that goal of being that tool that Adrian is looking for to help people around the world. I think we think it's really important. So at, uh, a couple of things about I2P. Everybody is a relay by default. That means you're all routing traffic for others. You're not just pushing traffic through a, a, a couple of, uh, a, a of self-selected computers. You, so everybody is sharing and helping. Uh, nobody is an exit node by default. That means you're not subject to, to routing your traffic out your computer onto the internet. Uh, so that makes it very safe. So that's all I have to say. Come up and get some stickers. I'd be happy, happy to answer any questions if you come up. And thank you again, Adrian, for a couple minutes of your time. Thank you, guys.